Amen. Good morning. How are you guys feeling today? You recovered from all the holiday stuff and ready to go? Okay, you better get ready to go. So we're starting a new series today, and uh, it's going to be a doozy for you, all right? So do you have something you can take notes on? You got a phone, paper, whatever you have, you're going to want to take notes. This is my friendly reminder that the people who take notes and show their notes at Heaven's Gate get to skip the line and get in first, okay? We'll, we'll see, we'll see. So we want to take notes. Um, let's start by this where we should always start. Let's stand. We're going to jump into the scripture today. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, and I want you to understand this is kind of the foundational passage for this whole series. So we're going to go other places, but you need to get this one. So I encourage you, read Ephesians chapter 4. Dig in to Ephesians chapter 4. This is the linchpin passage for this whole thing. Um, In verse 22, Paul writes this, put off your old, what's he say? Self, Self, which belongs to your, your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new, what? Self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, I told first service this, you got to get this piece. Put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Can you just let that sink in for one second? Some of you haven't seen that before. A lot of you haven't thought of that before. A new self created in the likeness of God, in righteousness and holiness. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come now. Open our minds. Open our hearts. Give us understanding, Lord. Holy Spirit, be our great, awesome teacher today and through this whole series and always, Lord. We thank you for your presence here with us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. So today we're starting this new series called Eighth Day People. Here is the kind of crazy, awesome reality. Everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus and receives the Holy Spirit, they live in the place in the center of our eight here on the graphic. They live in the place where heaven and earth overlap, where God's space and our space, God's dimension and our dimension, where they meet is where you are. Or let me put it more specifically. Everyone who has the Holy Spirit is the place where heaven and earth meet where they overlap. It's this huge, awesome, mysterious reality that we have to get. If you have the Holy Spirit, you are the place where heaven and earth meet. And I've realized, and the reason that I'm doing this series, which by the way, this whole sermon series started as a class And it will be a class because as we go through this, you're going to be saying, oh, there's a lot, a lot here, more than can be unpacked in in the 40, 45 minutes we have on a Sunday morning. So it is going to be a class. I'm like halfway through writing the class, but I thought, you know, it'd be helpful for me to get my thoughts together, helpful for you to just put this in the sermon series at the beginning of the year so you get some of the, get some of the stuff that God's wanting to do. Um, But the point of this whole thing is that I realize that there are many uh, genuine followers of Jesus in the room and in the world who they love Jesus, they really trust him, they really want to please him, they really want to live their lives for him. But when they look at the idea of being the place where heaven and earth overlap, when they look at some of the things that are said about and promised to people who have the Holy Spirit, that... uh, Those people would make people like Moses, who saw and spoke to God face to face, whose Moses' face shined with God's glory. You know, Moses, who saw his staff turn into a serpent and swallowed the serpent. All the things Moses saw, uh, that 
that people who have the Holy Spirit would make people like um, the prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel, who were literally caught up to the throne room of heaven. People who have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all the people, they longed for what you would have. Jesus himself said, those who have the Spirit, they're going to do greater things than I did. And it's just, it's just how it is for a lot of people that they hear that, they look at that, and they say, I love Jesus, I trust Jesus, but if I'm honest with myself, I'm kind of unimpressed with my walk with Jesus. Because I'm not, I don't feel like Moses would be jealous of what I have. I don't feel like what Jesus said is true, that I'm doing greater things. I'm still stuck, enslaved in sin. I'm not seeing God's power. I'm not having these face-to-face encounters with God. I don't even know if I've heard from God before. This is reality for many, many genuine people who love Jesus. They're going to heaven. You'll be there, but you're not living in heaven, it's reality now. And I'm telling you, I believe this with my whole heart. If you get through this and you walk out these things this series is going to touch on, that, that's going to change. Those, some of you who are enslaved in sin, you're going to be free. I'm not saying you're not going to struggle. You're, you're probably still going to struggle. But you're going to go from being a slave to struggling now and then. People who, you're like, I've never had a profound experience with God. I've never heard God's voice. You're going to start to hear him. And you're going to see some things happening in your life. You're going to walk in more power than you ever thought was possible. And you're going to start to see how the Bible can say things like, Moses longed to have what you had. Isaiah longed to see what you can see. Are you all ready for that? All right. So this idea of eighth day people, it actually comes from the gospel of John. I want to explain that really quickly. Um, John in particular, in his gospel, in his um, account of Jesus's life, he lines it up with the creation story found in Genesis. Okay. So John says, the very first chapter, he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, by Him all things were made. Okay? It's creation. And you go through the whole book, you get to Jesus' trial, and John really starts to pick up the creation story because he's going to try to tell us something very profound and very important. So in John chapter 19, Jesus has already, he's been beaten. He's been, he's been flogged. He's had the crown of thorns set on him. And Pilate comes out in verse four. He goes out to the people and he says to them, see, I am bringing him out to you that you may know I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold the man. Very important, very intentional by John. This is on Friday, the sixth day. Pilate says, behold the man. Because God created man on the sixth day. And so what is happening is John is saying, he's, he's using Pilate's words to really illustrate this. Behold the man, the true human, what humanity was always supposed to be. Here on the sixth day, here it is. It's not Adam, it's the second Adam. Behold the man on the sixth day. After God created man in Genesis, the Bible says that God finished his work. And so as Jesus, God in flesh, hangs on the cross in John 19, 28, he says, it is finished. The work is done. On the same day, God finished the work. You see what's happening. And Jesus dies. He gives up his spirit and the, John tells us he's laid in the tomb to rest Friday evening, which this can be a little confusing to us because, remember, 
Jewish days run evening to morning, where we kind of run morning to evening. But when Jesus is laid in the tomb Friday evening, that's the beginning of the Sabbath, the seventh day. Because God rested on the Sabbath, the seventh day. So Jesus, God in flesh, is laid to rest in the tomb on the seventh day. John's doing this on purpose. And then you get to John chapter 20, most important chapter in the Bible. If you ever get stranded on a desert island and you get to take one chapter with you, take John chapter 20 or Romans chapter 8, but Probably John chapter, maybe, you, maybe you'll get two. <clears throat> but John says this, John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary came to the tomb while it was still dark, it's back to creation talk, and saw the stone had been taken away. John paints this whole thing, the trial, the death, the burial, and the resurrection as the old week, seven days, is done. It's a new week. It's not a reset of the same old cycle. It's not the seven-day cycle. This is the eighth day, something we've never seen before, an existence we're not familiar with. Our weeks are seven days, but this is a new week, the eighth day. And the amazing thing is that new creation, literally new creation, however you want to think about it, new week, new day, it launches out of the tomb. And by the Holy Spirit, people who have the Spirit of God are eighth day people. Do you got that? I don't know what language is going to help you understand this the best. If it's the language of this series, that there are seventh-day people and there are eighth-day people. If it's Paul's language of there are, there's an old self and there's a new self. Uh, Paul talks about, again, there's flesh people, fleshy people. There's spirit people. I've used the language before for you scientific-minded people. There's homo sapiens and there's homo pneumaticus. I don't know what... People of the Spirit is what that is about. I don't know what language is going to help you grab onto this, but we ha- you have to get it. People with the Holy Spirit are something new. They're a new creation. They are eighth-day people. How y'all doing? You doing all right? So the title of this message is called The New Self. I almost called this message uh, the problem with modern discipleship, but that, that seemed a little too negative for the first of the year, so I decided to be positive for you all and call it the new self. But here, here's the problem with modern discipleship, and when I'm talking about discipleship, I'm talking about sermons you hear, um, inner healing ministries you're familiar with, deliverance ministries books you've read, classes you've taken. Those things are geared towards fixing seventh-day people. That's what a lot of it's all about. I'm going to fix your old stuff. And here's what I want you to get. Biblical discipleship, and this is going to be hard, a hard series to work through, because you're going to have to undo a lot of stuff. There's a lot more books out there on fixing Seventh-day people. There's a lot more classes, a lot more ministries, a lot more sermons that are about fixing Seventh-day people than there are about launching Eighth-day people. This is what discipleship is. It's about launching Eighth-day people. Jesus, we're going to look at a story of Jesus here in a moment, but Jesus never talks about repairing your old self. He doesn't say you need to fix your old self. You need to repair your old self. He says, you need a new self. You need a new self. 
He says to a Pharisee named Nicodemus, you have to be born again, a new self. And this new self is given as a free gift from God. You cannot get it on your own. You cannot choose it on your own. It's given as a free gift. And the new self, eighth day people, they grow and they are formed through the presence and the power of God. Let me put it to you kind of biblically here. Eighth day people are nourished by the tree of life right now. They eat of the tree of life, which is God's presence, right now. Where, what's Jesus say? Man doesn't live by bread alone. That's how seventh day people live. You're nourished by food, water, uh, compliments and affirmations of other people, whatever. Whatever fuels old, the old way of being human. Eighth day people are fueled only by God's presence, his power, the tree of life. I mean, okay, you guys are, you guys like me more than first service, so I'll, I'll say more, I'll, I'll say more stuff to you, but uh, I'm just kidding. I, you know how many, just figure out for yourself, use your imagination how many people come to me and say, you know, I've been trained in this ministry, or I've gone through this class, or I've gone through that, and I just nod my head but in my mind, I'm the, I do not care. I do not. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. Because here is, here is all that matters. Can you lead people to the tree of life? More important, do you get there yourself? Do you get to the presence of God? Do you eat of the tree of life? Do you experience this? That's all that matters. I don't need your six-step program, your eight-week class, your 12-week class, your what certificate. No. Can you get to the tree? Are you eating of the tree of life, God's presence? That's all that fuels the new self. This is discipleship yet again. <laughs> That's what it is fueling eighth-day people by the presence and the power of God. There's a lot of talk in the psychological kind of world that has slipped into the church about the true self and the false self. Have you all ever heard of this true self? You have a true self inside, but there's this false self that we all put out to the world. You wear a mask. You put on a show. You're not really yourself. We, some of us do this. You go to church and you're somebody else. You're somebody different than you are at home than you are with your friends. That's false self, true self. And that's come into Christian discipleship like in a strong way. Like all Jesus is here for is to help you get rid of the false self and let your true self shine. And that can sound really good. The problem is that's not what Jesus says. Listen very carefully. The truest version of Matt is hellbound. Hellbound. Going to hell. The truest version of yourself is hell bound. The most improved version of yourself is hell bound. The most fixed up, pretty, taped together version of yourself is hell bound. That's why Jesus says you have to have a new self. And that's why this sermon series that will most likely in the future become a class is not about fixing your old stuff. It's about launching your new self. And I know that sounds like a really good marketing tagline for like a motivational company. We're going to launch your new self. We want to step into your new self. But here's the thing you have to understand. If you're taking notes, write this down. 
Your new self is Jesus' self. It's literally Jesus' self. This is what Paul's talking about. It's not me that lives, it's Christ in me. Okay, it's not, new self is not the best version of you. New self is Jesus' self. Ephesians 4.24 again, this is the line that I'm telling you. Memorize this line. Dream about this line. Write this line like a hundred times like they used to make you do in school when you got in trouble. Not that you're in trouble, just I want you to get it. 24, put on the new self created after the likeness of God. That is a profound line of Scripture. The new self is not created after your best likeness. The new self is created after the likeness of God. Okay, now I'm using this term self. And um, if you've been in church for a while or you've read the books or you've gone through the classes, um, a lot of times they probably use the term identity. Know your identity. And I am intentionally using the word self instead of identity. Because in our world today, identity is chosen. I just pick what I want to identify as and who I want to identify with. And really for a long time, identity has been something that I make, that I can create through what I do, the career I have, the way I act. I'm building this life. I'm creating my identity. And here's what I want you to understand. Self is not that. Because self is not chosen and it is not created on your own. Self has to be given. Do you all get that? Identity can be chosen. It can be made. It can be worked towards. But self has to be given and the main reason I'm using this term is because that's what Paul says. Paul doesn't, says you have a, doesn't say you have a new identity and an old identity. He says you have a new self. And he uses the Greek word anthropos, which literally, you, you know this if you took a class in anthropology. It just means human. New human. Paul, what are you talking about when you say there's an old human, an old self, and a new human, a new self? Well, He's talking about every aspect, every single thing that makes you who and what you are. So here, let's put the definition up on the screen so you can kind of get an idea. Self is your experiences, your background, that includes your family history, all that stuff, your memories, your projects, your plans, what you like, what you don't like, your makeup as a whole. That's personality, brain wiring, whatever you want to call it. All that. Your whole life narrative and, is it still on the screen? Okay. And all of the spiritual processes that hold all that together. This is what Jesus says. Oh, if you're going to experience God, you need a new one of those. And that's where you go. Maybe this Christianity thing isn't quite what I thought it was. To experience God, to enter the kingdom, I need a new self. All that. That's what self is. It's all the complex inner workings of everything that make you, you. Jesus said, yeah, you want to experience God? You need a new one of those. Still Grant's line here. Okay. (laughs) John chapter 3. Jesus speaking to this Pharisee named Nicodemus. Verse 1. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, unless one is born, he says, anothen, Greek word that means again, and it also means from above. You must be born again, you must be born from above. And if you have a good study Bible, it'll have a footnote in there that says this word could mean again, this word could mean from above. Which one is it? It's both. You need to be born again and from above. What's that mean? He says to Nicodemus, here's the only way you're going to experience the kingdom of God. You have to start again. You have to have a new start and you have to have a new source. How can, I, how can a man experience God? How can a woman experience God? They have to start again and have a new source, a new start and a new source. Who can do that for themselves? No one. No one. You cannot start your life again. You cannot climb and struggle an attempt to get to heaven so that your life source is from above. I told you earlier, it must be given to you. I love, um, Nicodemus is so helpful because of who he is. Uh, he's like 95% of Christians in America today, I think. That's why this is such a great story, because you can kind of plug yourself in to Nicodemus a lot of the time. Because what's he say? He says, Jesus, you're a great teacher and you do amazing things. I like what you do or, or I like what you say, good teacher, and I like what you do and what you can do for me. Y'all real quiet. Have you never met a Christian <laughs> that their life and their idea about Jesus is, yeah, I like what he says. I want to try to follow his teachings. And I like what he does. I like that there's power there. I like that maybe he can do a good thing for me. I like what you say. I like what you teach. And I like what you do. And Jesus answered him. You have to be born uh, on a thing. Now that's not an answer. Did you notice that? <laughs> that's not an answer. Jesus, I really like what you say. I like what you do. Jesus says, you got to be born again. You must be born again. And it's also really important to notice, Jesus cannot mean, when he says you have to be born again, you have to be born from above, he cannot mean you have to be a more morally good person or you have to be a more religious person. And that's what a lot of people think born again is, that I'm joining this religion and I'm going to be better. And I've said many times, Christianity is not a new religion, it's a new life. Yes, that's right. Jesus cannot mean by being born again, you need to be a better moral person and a more religious person because Nicodemus is the most morally good person and the most religious person there is. He's a teacher of the law. This is on purpose. It's on purpose that this story isn't about, you know, kind of what we would call like the scum of the earth who are just horrible people and all that. No, this is the best person. He's good. He's religious. He's so, here's how good he is. He teaches other people how to be good and righteous. He's a teacher of the law. He's got his life together. Everything's good for him. He has, a, in his mind, you know, my, my conscience is clear. I'm a good person. I help people. I'm the one that trains people how to follow God. And Jesus says to him, you have to be born again. You need a new self. All that stuff about, you know, the role you play in life. What I talked about was self, your memories who you are, your makeup, that all has to be new, even for you, Nicodemus. And so Nicodemus says what uh, 
probably most of you are saying in your head, I can tell by the look on your face, this is what you're thinking. He's like, what? I need a new self, a new total life narrative, all this. That's not what? So he says, how, how in the world can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter into the wo- his mother's womb uh, and be born? Question mark? You see the question? <laughs> you want to see Jesus' answer? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. I, lo- I love how Jesus answers us because he doesn't answer at all. <laughs> and all it does, it just shows you that, you know, we're just so far, like, out in left field. We're not even close to lining up to what he's talking about. But he doesn't, that doesn't bother him. He just keeps on talking about what he's talking about. You notice that? He's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not coming over out in left field with you. I'm just going to keep going with what I'm talking about. You have to have a new self. You have to be born again. Ask all the questions you want to ask. Keep talking, keep talking. I'm just sitting here talking about what I'm talking about. If you want to experience God, you want to enter the kingdom, you got to be born again. How can you be born again? Uh, If you want to experience the kingdom, you want to experience God, you got to be born of water and spirit. Now, uh, this part is funny to me because Nicodemus, he is a Bible teacher. Okay, he knows the word better. He's got the thing memorized. And Jesus says, he's essentially saying to him, when he asks the question, can a man, how can a man be born again? Jesus is essentially saying, have you ever read your Bible before? <laughs> you teach the word. Have you ever read this thing before? Because if you did, you would know what the prophets say, that the only hope for humanity is that the Spirit comes like water. This is, what he's, um, this is what Ezekiel talks about. This is what Isaiah talks about. There will be a rain, and that rain is the Spirit. And when that water and Spirit come, guess what? Man's heart that is like stone, okay, that's the core center of who you are. This is heart. We'll talk about that more as we go through the series. But that center of who you are is stone. That's got to be totally new and become a heart of flesh, and this happens by the Spirit. This, again, just the same way, or different way of saying the same thing. New creation, eighth day, new humanity. When the Spirit comes like the rainwater, that's what's going to happen in people. But you must be born of water and Spirit, which is to say you consist of the wrong stuff to experience God. You're made of stuff that cannot enter to the throne room. And so you must be made of something new and different. Let me use this as an illustration for you. I have in my hands a picture of little Lily. um, And she's on the screen so you can see what's in my hand. Um, That's at her first birthday party, loving her cake. And... um, So the first thing that I want to say is this picture is not Lily. This is an image of Lily. Do you see the difference? Lily is at home right now. This is an image of Lily. And we know in the creation account, all people are made in God's image. They're an image of him. How y'all doing? Okay, I see some glazed over eyes out there, so I'm trying to keep, bring you back, come back in, come back in, we're almost there. All people are an image of God. They are not God. And I just want to speak to that really quickly, because there's a lot of stuff in kind of like new age stuff and coming into the church that, oh, no, people are, are God, we're little God. And we can speak and create things just like God spoke and created things and all the stuff. No, you're not God. People aren't God. They're an image of God. This is not Lily. This is an image of Lily. And all people are God's image. And so they are worthy of honor and dignity and respect. All of them. Paul says that there's a new self 
that isn't just the image, but it's created in the likeness of God. And this is the shift from seventh day to eighth day people, is they go from image to likeness. Now, here's my second question. Okay, so this is not Lily. This is an image of Lily. Next question is, is this like Lily? Well, I would say, as her dad, I know her pretty well. Um, No, this is not like Lily. Um, Lily can move. Lily can make a lot of noise. Lily, Lily likes to dance. This doesn't do any of that stuff. It looks like her, but that's the extent of it. It really is not like her. It's not totally like her. And so let me put this biblically for you. This is born of ink and paper. It consists of different things than the lily. And so it is not like Lily, and it cannot be like Lily because it doesn't have all the stuff going on, you know, all the neurons firing and muscles contracting, all this, whatever, to be like Lily. It's made of something that can't do that, ink and paper. It's born of ink and paper. Lily's born of flesh and blood, which is why she's Lily. And so Jesus says, well, you're born of flesh and blood, but to experience the encounter of God you got to be born of water and spirit. You see it? That picture is born of ink and paper. That's not like Lily because Lily is born of flesh and blood. But Lily is born of flesh and blood. That's not like God because to be like God, you must be born of water and spirit. Okay. And that is where you move to likeness. Because you're born of and consist of spirit, and God is spirit. Yes. 